Thus we declare, thus we affirm, thus we proclaim Christ our true God and honor his saints in words, writings, thoughts, sacrifices, churches, and holy icons. On the one hand, worshiping and reverencing Christ as God and Lord, and on the other, honoring the saints as true servants of the same Lord of all and offering them proper veneration. This is the faith of the apostles. This is the faith of the fathers. This is the faith of the Orthodox. This is the faith on which the world is established. Is this really the faith of the apostles, the fathers, and the Orthodox? Is it really the faith on which the world is established? On September 25, 2022, the Patriarch of Moscow addressed his nation. Жертвенность есть величайшее проявление самых лучших человеческих качеств. И вот мы знаем, что сегодня многие погибают на полях между усобной бранью. Церковь молится о том, чтобы брань сия закончилась как можно быстрее, чтобы как можно меньше братьев убили друг друга в этой братоубийственной войне. И одновременно церковь осознает, что если кто-то, движенный чувством долга, необходимостью исполнить свою присягу, остается верным своему призванию и идет исполнять то, что его долг ему велит, И если в исполнении этого долга человек погибает, то он, несомненно, совершает деяние, равносильное жертве. Он себя приносит в жертву за других. И потому верим, что эта жертва смывает все грехи, которые человек совершил. Did Jesus really die so that we could atone for our sins in battle? In spite of all its claims, Eastern Orthodoxy isn't the faith of the Apostles nor of the Fathers. It's a corruption and twisting of that faith through man-made traditions. The Catholic Church, as never having spoken or speaking from herself, but from the Spirit of God, who being her teacher, she is ever unfailingly rich. It is impossible for her to in any wise err, or to at all deceive, or be deceived. But like the divine scriptures, is infallible, and has perpetual authority. The Pharisees claim to have an unwritten tradition that went back to Moses, and was just as authoritative as the written word of God. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashen hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The church fathers spoke a great deal of tradition, that which had been handed down but they saw the scriptures as the heart of that tradition. We have learned from none other the plan of our salvation than from those through whom the gospel has come down to us, which they did at one time proclaim in public, and at a later period, by the will of God, handed down to us in the scriptures to be the ground and pillar of our faith. Irenaeus passed along the stories he heard from those who knew the apostles, but he also warned that oral traditions were often used to promote heresy. When, however, they are confuted from the scriptures, they turn round and accuse these same scriptures as if they were not correct, nor of authority, and assert that they are ambiguous and that the truth cannot be extracted from them by those who are ignorant of tradition. For they allege that the truth was not delivered by means of written documents, but orally. Rome claims papal infallibility, purgatory, and Mary herself being immaculately conceived 
are all apostolic traditions that have been handed down orally through the church. Eastern Orthodoxy denies all these, but also the Protestant idea that the scriptures alone are infallible. From an Orthodox perspective, uh, this is in fact the mother of the Protestant heresy, and you're right to say that I point this out in my book. It's not me saying it. This has been the first principle of Orthodox witness to the Protestant reformers from the 16th century. Um, we, we pointed out from the very beginning that if we, you do not respect the tradition of the church, if you make the mistake that Luther made, which was to jump from a recognition of the errors of post-schism Latin councils to a criticism of ecumenical councils, as soon as you make that move, that unsubstantiated false move, which Luther and all the reformers agreed on, that all general councils had erred, as soon as they did that, they made them popes of the church. That was not the consciousness in the mind of the church for a thousand years. They made years. themselves popes of the church. Absolutely. They became judges of ecumenical councils. And if they're judges of ecumenical councils, who is going to judge them? Josiah Trenum glosses over the fact that Rome, the Orthodox, and the Protestants all reject the Synod of Tyre that condemned Athanasius, even though it was roughly the same size as the Council of Nicaea and took place only ten years later. The father of Orthodoxy spent much of 18 years in exile, standing against the Bishop of Rome and councils on the authority of the Word of God. Vainly then do they run about with the pretext that they have demanded councils for the faith's sake. For divine scripture is sufficient above all things. But if a council be needed on the point, there are the proceedings of the fathers. For the Nicene bishops did not neglect this matter but stated the doctrine so exactly that persons reading their words honestly cannot but be reminded by them of the religion towards Christ announced in divine scripture. Numerous synods and councils that had supported Arianism were later rejected by the Council of Constantinople. Orthodox admit these smaller councils were in error, but we're to believe ecumenical councils speak with the authority of the Holy Spirit. I, I like to think of it this way. If Martin Luther was living at the time of the Apostles and the first council of the church took place, which was the council that met in Jerusalem as recorded in Acts chapter 15, this was a council, like all councils, that was convoked in response to the uh, appearance of a heresy. This heresy was the Judaizing heresy. If all general councils err, would it have been legitimate for Martin Luther to stand up, let's say he was living in Athens, and he said, no, I'm sorry, I disagree with the apostles. They're in, in contradiction to the scriptures. Mm. The apostles would have said, you don't have that right because you're misunderstanding our counsel. Didn't you hear us? It has seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit to decide this. The faith of the church is that corporately, when the church needs to, she can come together and be confident that her decisions are guided by the Holy Spirit and that the gates of hell will not prevail. Martin Luther doesn't have that conviction. Hmm. The Reformers never rejected the Apostles' authority. It agreed with the Law and the Prophets and was attested with unquestionable miracles. But Trenum would have us believe their purported successors have the same authority without miracles and when they contradict what the Apostles clearly taught in the Scriptures. He also ignores that the Eastern Orthodox reject 14 of the 21 councils Rome declares ecumenical just as Rome rejects six of the 13 councils that at least some Orthodox declare as ecumenical. Both reject the Council of Hyaria that met just outside Constantinople in the year 754, even though its attendance was greater than five of the previous six ecumenical councils, and it declared itself the seventh. Why is it rejected? Because it sounds Protestant. The Holy and Ecumenical Synod, therefore assembled, and we, its 338 members follow the older synodal decrees and accept and proclaim joyfully the dogmas handed down, principally those of the six holy ecumenical synods. After we had carefully examined their decrees under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we found, if anyone ventures to represent in human figures by means of material colors, by reason of the Incarnation, the substance or person of the Word, which cannot be depicted, and does not rather confess 
that even after the incarnation it cannot be depicted, let him be anathema. If anyone does not accept this, our holy and ecumenical seventh synod, let him be anathema from the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, and from the seven holy ecumenical synods. Hyaria was overturned 33 years later by the Second Council of Nicaea, which, though less than half its size, declared itself the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Just as Second Nicaea overturned Hyaria, it was overturned 28 years later by the Council of Constantinople meeting in the Hagia Sophia and presided over by the Patriarch of Constantinople. It declared the Council of Hyaria was the Seventh Ecumenical Council. But then that was reversed yet again in the year 843 when the Empress Theodora came to the throne and declared Second Nicaea authoritative. One of the councils declared ecumenical by Rome was the 15th century council of Ferrara Florence. It had been called by the Byzantine emperor in hopes of presenting a united Orthodox and Catholic front against the Ottoman Turks. It included the Pope, the Patriarch of Constantinople, and representatives of the Patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem. In 1439, it issued a statement declaring itself an ecumenical council, and accepted the primacy of the Pope, the filioque, the doctrine of purgatory, and the use of unleavened bread in communion. Only one Eastern bishop, Mark of Ephesus, refused to sign, but the Orthodox say he, not the council, represents true orthodoxy. Святитель Марк был в меньшинстве, но он выступил против огромной ошибки, которую делали другие отцы не осознавая, какие последствия могут за этой ошибкой последовать. Он отстоял верность православию. On principle, we don't believe in purgatory, and this was something that was very clearly articulated by St. Mark of Ephesus at the Council of Ferrara Florence in 1438 and 1439. We have four of his homilies extant today uh, against purgatory. This was something that the Orthodox would not go for. Opposition to the Union led the Russian Church to declare itself autocephalous in 1448. Tensions in Constantinople forced Patriarch Gregory III to withdraw to Rome in 1451. When Constantinople fell to the Turks two years later, Sultan Mehmed the Conqueror replaced Gregory with the anti-Unionist Gennadios II as Patriarch. Gennadios repudiated the Council of Ferrara Florence, renewing the Great Schism, and ensuring there would be no appeals to the West for military help. The simple reality is that Orthodox don't define their faith by ecumenical councils, but they define councils as ecumenical by whether or not they agree with them. They're happy for individuals like Athanasius and Mark of Ephesus to stand against councils, but then are appalled at Luther and Calvin doing the same. Just as Josiah Trenum glosses over the fact that even supposedly ecumenical councils contradict one another. He caricatures the position of the Protestant reformers. Apostolic tradition, which is the ultimate authority, came to the church through letters and through mouth. And that can be seen in the life of the Thessalonians themselves. Paul lived with them for a year and a half, I believe, in the Acts of the Apostles. He taught them day in and day out for 18 months. Can you imagine having as your pastor the great apostle, and sitting with St. Paul and having him teach you day in and day out, think of the education, the formation, the spiritual guidance you would have received from the apostle. He left you two small letters, one with five chapters, one with three. Most of what you would have received from St. Paul would have been oral. Imagine that after that time he had to go away on his apostolic ministries, his missionary trips, then he was martyred in Rome. The Protestants would like us to think that the moment St. Paul died, when Nero put him to death and cut his head off, all of a sudden, the only apostolic teaching that remains binding are these two little letters. I mean, spoken that way, it's just preposterous. It's absolutely mm. ridiculous. Orthodox can't actually provide a single word of Paul's teaching outside the Bible. They're simply assuming the unbiblical things the church did centuries later must have been supported by oral teachings. Paul didn't leave the Thessalonian church with only two letters, but a Bible. And that Bible makes clear that even in the days of the apostles, oral traditions lent themselves to the promotion of error. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die. 
Yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Here's an oral tradition that supposedly went back to Jesus himself, but it had to be corrected by authentic apostolic teaching. Jesus didn't question whether Moses had taught things orally, but whether they had been faithfully preserved. He rejected the Jews' oral traditions as counterfeits. The scriptures aren't the revelations of God that just happen to be written down, but those God ordained to be preserved as a record by which all other traditions should be judged. When Rome and the Orthodox contradicted one another on oral tradition and councils, when both contradicted the scriptures and the church fathers, the reformers held to the Bible as their ultimate authority. But that doesn't mean they ignore tradition. The Swiss Reformation began with Ulrich Zwingli, not only reading the Bible, but Chrysostom's sermons from the 4th century. John Calvin cited the church fathers over 800 times in his Institutes of the Christian Religion to demonstrate that they read the Bible contrary to what Rome demanded be recognized as oral tradition. His French Confession of 1559 states, We confess that which has been established by the ancient councils, and we detest all sects and heresies which were rejected by the holy doctors, such as St. Hilary, St. Athanasius, St. Ambrose, and St. Cyril. Behind all its claims of tradition, it's Eastern Orthodoxy that contradicts the historic faith of the Church. This can be clearly seen in its claims about icons. The 8th century monk John of Damascus insisted icons weren't simply permissible, but absolutely necessary to the Christian faith. He said those who refused to venerate them weren't warring against images but against Christ and his saints. He was declared a heretic by the Council of Hyeria in the year 754, but 33 years later the Second Council of Nicaea declared him a saint. This link between icon and gospel is greatly emphasized by St. John of Damascus, and his three homilies on the holy icons are still the best patristic work for anyone to read who wishes to enter into the meaning of the icon. John's three treatises on divine images became the basis for Second Nicaea's demand for the veneration of icons. He pointed out that Abraham had bowed or offered proskinesis to the people of the land, and Joseph's brothers had offered him proskinesis. John argued this was a fundamentally different reverence from Latreia, which is the worship of God alone. If Joseph's brothers bowed to him, surely we should also bow to icons. If Christians were commanded to greet the saints with a holy kiss, surely we should also kiss the images of those saints who are now in heaven. The Second Nicene Council declared that icons are to be given due salutation and honorable proskinesis, not indeed that true Latreia of faith, which pertains alone to the divine nature. This continues to be the position of the Orthodox Church to this day. There is a clear distinction here made between veneration and adoration. Adoration belongs to God alone. But all of us venerate to some extent different people, different things. We show honor and respect. And so we venerate our holy images, but we do not adore them as we adore God. It is not worship. The problem is that in the Septuagint, the second commandment specifically forbids Latreia and proskenesis to an image, not just an image of a false god or to an image of the invisible god, but to any man-made image. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. John argued the Orthodox don't really offer veneration to the image, but to the one represented in the image. 
His critics pointed out that the pagans had argued the same thing about their idols for centuries. And God specifically forbids even making such images, much less bowing to them or kissing them. John appealed to the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant and to the brazen serpent Moses made in the wilderness. He said God had clearly commanded the making of graven images. But his critics countered that these were never intended for veneration. The Ark was kept out of sight in the Holy of Holies, and God commended Hezekiah for destroying the brazen serpent when the Israelites began to burn incense to it. John insisted whatever objections might be offered from the Old Testament were irrelevant because everything changed with Christ's incarnation. Before, God was invisible, but in Jesus we have the image, or icon, of the invisible God. The Seventh Ecumenical Council based its conclusions on our faith in the incarnation. Through the incarnation of Christ, matter itself has been sanctified. Its very nature has been changed. It's, it's relation with God is altered. The physical universe is now in a different relationship to God than it was before the Incarnation. And this is a master theme of St. John of Damascus. In the Old Testament he says, it was not possible for there to be any icon of God. No one has seen God at any time. But this has been changed by the incarnation of God. If you reject the icon, or if you deny the, depict the, the depictability of Christ, you're denying the truth of the incarnation. It all seems so reasonable, but John's critics pointed out that God had made himself visible throughout the Old Testament, not only in appearances like the burning bush, but also in human form, when the three men ate with Abraham, and when Isaiah saw the Lord on his throne. They admitted that proskynesis was offered to people, but pointed out that when Cornelius started to offer it to Peter, he stopped him, just as the angel did when John started to offer it to him. He told John instead to offer proskynesis to God. John's critics said the Old Testament was explicit, that such veneration wasn't to be offered to lifeless images. And the New Testament was strangely silent on something John insisted was absolutely necessary to the faith. He said they were refusing to hear the unwritten oral tradition represented in the historic faith of the church. It's a claim still made by the Orthodox. Well, we have evidence of the ancient church having had icons. In fact, St. Luke himself is credited with having painted the first icon of the Virgin Mary. Do such claims hold up to scrutiny? When Constantine ended persecution of the church in the year 313, his sister Constantia requested an image of Jesus from Bishop Eusebius of Caesarea. He responded, Can it be that you have forgotten the passage in which God lays down the law that no likeness should be made, either of what is in heaven or what is in the earth beneath? Have you ever heard anything of the kind, either yourself in church or from another person? Are not such things banished and excluded from churches all over the world? Another 4th century bishop, Epiphanius of Salamis, stated on discovering a church building, I went in to pray and found there a curtain hanging on the doors of the said church, dyed and embroidered. It bore an image either of Christ or of one of the saints. I do not rightly remember whose the image was. Seeing this, and being loath that an image of a man should be hung up in Christ's church, contrary to the teaching of the Scriptures, I tore it asunder and advised the custodians of the place to use it as a winding sheet for some poor person. Here were two bishops on opposite sides of the Arian controversy, yet speaking with one voice against the veneration of images. John of Damascus declared such, quotes forgeries of the iconoclast. He said the proof that Epiphanius didn't object to images was found in his own church in Salamis, which he said we see adorned with images to this very day. He seems unaware that in the intervening 300 years, Arab raiders had destroyed Epiphanius's basilica. The church of John's day was a much later building, finished not long before John had been born. He said even if Epiphanius did oppose images in worship, 
A single opinion can't overturn the unanimous tradition of the whole church, which has spread to the ends of the earth. The earliest source he cites to prove that tradition is the story of King Abgar of Edessa, who John says sent a messenger to Jesus desiring his image. Jesus pressed his face in a cloth, leaving an image, and sent it to the king. Here was Jesus making an icon and establishing their legitimacy once and for all. The problem is that the earliest documentation for Abgar communicating with Jesus comes from Eusebius, nearly three centuries after Jesus' crucifixion, and there's no mention of an image. He said Abgar requested Jesus come and heal him. Instead, Jesus sent him a letter, explaining that after his resurrection, he would send one of his disciples to do so. The letter even has Jesus saying, They who have seen me will not believe in me, and they who have not seen me will believe and be saved. The pilgrimage area visited Edessa in the late 4th century and wrote of being shown a letter from Jesus by the archbishop, but she makes no mention of an image. About the year 400, we have a description of an image in the doctrine of Adai, but it says the king's painter was the messenger sent to Jesus. He painted his portrait and brought it back to the king. The claim that the image was made miraculously can't be found before the 6th century, yet John of Damascus believed it to be apostolic oral tradition and 1st century evidence for icons. Another source he cites from the 1st century is Dionysius the Areopagite, who was converted by the Apostle Paul in Acts 17. John quotes from four of his works, including a letter to the Apostle John. Here were supposed to be the earliest and most authoritative writings outside the Scriptures. Dionysius' works clearly state they were written by Paul's convert. The problem is that even the Orthodox now admit their forgeries, written not in the 1st century, but the 6th. These works don't appear to have antedated the turn of the 6th century, so they could not have been by the 1st century person. And the short answer as to who the author of this corpus is, is we don't know. Orthodox often criticize Rome for basing its claims on fake histories. And of course that was all supported by the face, the fake, the false decretals that were invented in the ninth century in the Catholic tradition in which Emperor Constantine supposedly gave his mitre to, uh, to the Pope and declared that he had authority over the temporal realm as well. A, a false assertion that the Catholic Popes maintained for a very long time. Just as the donation of Constantine was a medieval invention, masquerading as ancient tradition. So were the writings of Dionysius. Another source John cites is the early 2nd century martyrdom of Eustace, whose name was originally Placida. John tells how, as a Roman officer, he was hunting a stag when a blazing cross and then an icon of Jesus appeared in its antlers. The stag then identified himself as Jesus. Oh, Placida, why are you chasing me? Behold, for your sake, I came close to you and was seen by you in this living being. I am Jesus Christ, whom, without knowing, you reverence. For your good deeds, which you did to those who besought you, are present before me, and I came to manifest myself to you through this stag. Like the story of Abgar, this is supposed to be a very early witness for icons, but it was really a legend that appears sometime in the 6th or 7th centuries. Out of the over 100 citations John offers, only three others actually predate the Council of Nicaea in the 4th century. Clement of Alexandria describes the true Gnostic looking towards the good images, namely the many patriarchs who achieved success before him. The context leads some translators to render it models rather than images. To read it as referring to icons ignores what Clement said six chapters earlier when he said works of art cannot be sacred and divine. Methodius is quoted as describing the making of gold images of angels, and Theodore, bishop of Pentapolis, is quoted as describing an icon. But John is our only source for both quotes, so we can't determine their genuineness or context. Of the thousands of pages we have from the first three centuries of the Church, these nine citations are the evidence that was supposed to represent the unanimous tradition of icon veneration. Six are themselves forgeries. One doesn't refer to icons, 
and the last two are ones for which we have no attestation before John of Damascus in the 8th century. Yet Second Nicaea anathematized those who said the veneration of icons wasn't the tradition of the church. Another source John cites is from the supposed life of Basil in the 4th century. The holy man was standing by the image of Our Lady, on which was painted also the likeness of Mercurius, the renowned martyr. He was standing by it, asking for the removal of the impious apostate Julian, and he received this revelation from the statue. He saw the martyr vanish for a time, and then reappear, holding a bloody spear. There were tributes written soon after Basil's death by his brother Gregory of Nyssa and Gregory Nazianzus, along with a third commonly attributed to Ephraim the Syrian. Not only do none make mention of this incident, but they're all substantially contradicted by this supposed biography. It also describes Basil meeting Bishop Leontius of Caesarea, whom the author didn't seem to know had been martyred before Basil was ever born. This idea that Mercurius disappeared from his icon and killed the Emperor Julian is yet one more medieval legend that, like Epiphanius's church, John presumed to be much older than it really was. Many of John's 4th century witnesses are interpreted through what he thinks he's already established, and they simply don't say what he seems to think they do. He cites Basil saying, The honor offered to the image passes to the archetype. But Basil's context wasn't icons but Jesus as the image of the invisible God. Most of John's later sources are genuine, but if they're sorted by the actual dates, you see that the claims for icons start with a few mentions of decorative art, or honoring the remains of the martyrs. This grows into full-blown veneration of the saints only centuries after the apostles. In all of John's evidences, there are two that are notable by their absence. The first is the claim that Luke painted the first icon of Mary. Who painted the first icon of the Virgin Mary? That would be St. Luke, the evangelist and philosopher and doctor and artist. This claim can't be documented before the 6th century and was apparently unknown to John, but that doesn't stop it from being told and retold. But we Orthodox know what Christ looked like because the very first icon was painted by none other than the Apostle Luke, the physician. And in fact, this is an exact copy of the one he painted, the Vladimir Mother of God. I actually was able to venerate one of the originals of this icon, actually the original, when I was in Moscow many years ago. Despite insistence by many that the Vladimir icon was painted by Luke, even some Orthodox admit it was made a thousand years too late. Behind these legends seems to be the realization that if the apostles had actually intended us to venerate images, they could have easily passed down paintings. But they didn't. Another proof that's notable in its absence in the writings of John of Damascus is a quote often attributed to Basil by modern Orthodox apologists. I acknowledge also the holy apostles, prophets, and martyrs, and I invoke them to supplication to God, that through them, that is, through their mediation, the merciful God may be propitious to me, and that a ransom may be made and given me for my sins. Wherefore also I honor and kiss the feature of the images, inasmuch as they have been handed down from the holy apostles, and are not forbidden, but are in all our churches. Here's a quote that's claimed to settle the case of icons, yet it was apparently unknown to John and the Second Council of Nicaea. It runs contrary to the rest of what we know from the 4th century and Basil. It appears to either be a fabrication, or like some quotes John said came from Athanasius, misattributions from much later centuries. Contrary to the letter's claim that all churches venerated icons, there were many voices clearly against them, besides Clement, Eusebius, and Epiphanius. The only professing Christians actually described as having icons in the early church were the Gnostics, Irenaeus said some claimed to have an image of Jesus, made by Pontius Pilate. Tertullian summed up the attitude of the early apologist, stating the principal crime of the human race, the highest guilt charged upon the world. The whole procuring cause of judgment is idolatry. 
He noted an image of a shepherd on cups without comment, but said the portrayal of the shepherd of Hermas on a communion chalice would prostitute the sacrament. In answer to those who appeal to the brazen serpent as justifying Christian art, he says, imitate Moses, make not any likeness in opposition to the law, unless to you too God has bidden it. Origen was the head of the catechetical school in Alexandria. He described Christians as those who, being taught in the school of Jesus Christ, have rejected all images and statues. What reasonable man can refrain from smiling when he sees that one who has learned from philosophy such profound and noble sentiments about God or the gods turns straight away to images and offers to them his prayers, or imagines that by gazing upon these material things he can ascend from the visible symbol to that which is spiritual and immaterial. Orthodox dismiss Origen as a heretic when they disagree with him, but Saints Basil and Gregory of Nyssa later published extracts from this work and introduced it by saying, They who submit to the law of Moses are hated by the worshippers of images. About the year 305, the Synod of Elvira in Spain stated, There shall be no pictures in the church, lest what is worshipped and adored should be depicted on the walls. In modern Syria, excavations at Dura Europus unearthed a third-century church with paintings on its walls. Like the chalice denounced by Tertullian, these are sometimes appealed to as undermining the prohibitions on images, rather than seeing them as the reason such prohibitions were made. What's striking is that the images bear little resemblance to the icons that are supposed to go back to the apostles. It's sometimes objected there are icons in the catacombs. This image is from the catacombs of San Senatori, which date back to the late 3rd century. But what's not immediately obvious is St. Smargatus on the right died in the year 840, and the image is estimated to be 11th or 12th century. Such images are often assumed to be much older than they really are. The same is true of the use of an iconostas. The iconostas is that's a very late development by Orthodox standards. St. John Chrysostom never saw an iconostas. Heavens no. Heavens no. That's centuries after St. John Chrysostom. The, the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom does not even presume an iconostas. For all the rationalizations that icons are sermons for the eyes, we see no Christian art before the 3rd century. Some will claim this is from the mid-2nd century. And even if it is, rather than imitating an icon by Luke, it demonstrates the evolution of Christian art from mere decoration to its modern form. In terms of Epiphanius, it's noteworthy that the quote denounced by John as a forgery was considered genuine by Epiphanius's good friend Jerome who translated it into Latin. Contrary to the claims that Luke painted the first icon of Mary, Augustine said in the early 5th century, neither do we know the countenance of the Virgin Mary. Icons are supposed to represent the triumph of orthodoxy, the triumph of oral apostolic tradition over sola scriptura. The reality is that they require us not only to reject the written word of God, but the writings of the early church fathers. The earliest icons were among the Gnostics and represent the same impulse that led the Jews into idolatry. They no more go back to the apostles than the traditions of the Jews went back to Moses. They are the triumph of false histories and rationalizations over the explicit teaching of God's Word and the early church fathers. Just as Israel couldn't fathom that a jealous God would be offended by being represented as a golden calf, Orthodox can't fathom that the infinite Son of God could be offended by being represented in their icons. Before presuming to do what seems reasonable in the area of worship, everyone should carefully consider the story of Nadab and Abihu. They were the sons of Aaron, the high priest. The Lord had been very specific about how he was to be worshipped, but they did what was right in their own eyes. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire therein, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said unto Aaron, This is it that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, 
and before all the people I will be glorified. Icons are definitional to the Orthodox faith, but their medieval superstition masquerading as apostolic tradition. Their roots are not in the scriptures or the earliest church fathers. The same is true of what Orthodox teach about Mary. About the year 175, the Roman philosopher Celsus was repeating the slander found in the Jewish Talmud that Mary was turned out by her husband, a carpenter by trade, because she was convicted of adultery. She bore a child to a soldier named Panthera. The Proto-Evangelium, or the Gospel of James, the brother of Jesus, answered such accusations with claims that went far beyond anything in the New Testament. It portrayed Mary not simply as a virgin, but unimaginably holy. She was miraculously born to a barren mother. The oldest manuscripts even have her being conceived while her father was away for two months. When she was six months old, her mother stood her up, and she took seven steps. Her mother determined she was too holy to touch the ground again until she was dedicated in the temple at the age of three. There she ran up the steps and was taken to live in the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest was to enter, and only once a year. There she was fed by an angel. Not only did she conceive Jesus miraculously, but instead of a traditional birth, a blinding light appeared, and as it gradually decreased, the infant appeared. When a midwife was told the story by another, she insisted on physically examining Mary and discovered that even after the birth, her virginity was still intact. It is from this proto-evangelium that Orthodox get the feast of Mary's nativity and her entrance into the temple. The problem is that like the writings of Dionysius the Areopagite and the donation of Constantine, we know James the brother of Jesus didn't actually write this even though it explicitly claims him as its author. The real author was seriously confused about the geography of Israel, calling the land around Bethlehem a desert. When Luke has Joseph living in Nazareth of Galilee, the author instead has him in Judea. At Jesus' birth, the Magi left Jerusalem and traveled five miles south to Bethlehem. All of this is in the heart of Judea, but the writer not only contradicts the New Testament by having Jesus born outside of Bethlehem, but apparently outside of Judea as well, because the wise men are warned after seeing him not to enter Judea. The author is also confused on other matters. He describes Joseph undergoing the test of bitter waters that God prescribed only for women. He identifies Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, as the Jewish high priest, when Luke only identifies him as one of the multitude of ordinary priests. The high priest served year-round, but just as Zacharias is described in Luke's Gospel, an ordinary priest served two weeks a year, and lots were taken for what duties he would perform. The Jewish historian Josephus gives us a list of all the high priests for that time, and not one of them was named Zacharias. The high priest he names for the time of Mary's childhood was Simon, the son of Boethus, and the father-in-law to King Herod. The author also seems to conflate this first century Zacharias with the son of Berechias, who was killed hundreds of years earlier in the temple. And he says after his murder, he was succeeded as high priest by Simeon, the old man from the Gospel of Luke. Once again, this is something that goes far beyond what the scriptures tell us and is contrary to all historical evidence. Orthodox call this holy tradition, but it's not from the apostles or the church fathers. It's from a counterfeit made to give legitimacy to something that wasn't really apostolic. This isn't simply modern Protestant opinion. In the year 405, Pope Innocent I listed the Proto-Evangelium among the works that are not only to be rejected, but also condemned. Pope Galatius listed it among the works, not merely rejected, but eliminated from the whole Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, and with their authors, and the followers of its authors, to be damned in the inextricable shackles of anathema forever. In spite of all this, by the time you get to the 8th century, John of Damascus and others were preaching the Proto-Evangelium as authoritative as Scripture, and Orthodox continue to do so to this day. And today we're talking about the second great feast of the Theotokos, which is her entrance into the temple. When she was three years old, they brought her to the temple 
And they brought her to dedicate her there and to, in a sense, leave her there. And they were concerned. They were worried. She's just a little child. She's going to be scared. She's going to be afraid to go into this massive stone temple. And so they had some of the young women that we see here in the icon holding candles. And they were going to have these young women walk ahead of her into the temple so that seeing these pretty young girls with their candles, she'd be excited and she'd go in. But the Theotokos already at that young age had an overwhelming love for the God who would one day be her son. And so the story tells us that she ran up the stairs. She bypassed these young women and she ran up the stairs and there she was greeted by Zacharias, who was the high priest at that time, and he, instructed by God himself, ushered her into the Holy of Holies. Far more important than it being the basis of some homilies, the story has also been incorporated into the church's hymns, which for orthodoxy carry the same authority as its creeds. And this Proto-Evangelium isn't simply the basis of a couple of feasts, but it's the foundation for almost all the claims made for Mary's perpetual virginity. About the year 383, Jerome claimed support for the doctrine from Ignatius and a number of others in the early church. But all we really find them saying was that Mary was a virgin before Jesus' birth, and Irenaeus saying she delivered without the pain connected with the curse on Eve. Only two church fathers can be found before the Council of Nicaea who actually claim Mary continued to be a virgin after Jesus' birth. Clement of Alexandria and his student Origen. The Orthodox readily dismiss both in their rejection of icons, but praise them when they need them to support their views on Mary. Not only does Clement seem to have gotten his ideas from the Proto-Evangelium, but he recognized them as a minority position. It appears that even today, many hold that Mary, after the birth of her son, was found to be in the state of a woman who has given birth, while, in fact, she was not so. For some say that, after giving birth, she was examined by a midwife who found her to be a virgin. Please note, Clement says some say. Not everyone knows from the apostles but merely some people claim Mary was found to still be a virgin. Evidence that he's drawing the story of the midwife from the Proto-Evangelium is that his student Origen specifically cites it as his evidence in making a similar claim. The book of James records that the brethren of Jesus were sons of Joseph by a former wife, whom he married before Mary. Now, those who say so wish to preserve the honor of Mary in virginity to the end, so that body of hers, which was appointed to minister to the Word, might not know intercourse with a man after the Holy Spirit came into her and the power from on high overshadowed her. Much of what Eastern Orthodox claim as holy tradition comes from such sources. Should all these arguments not suffice, we relate as a final piece of proof that Mary lived her entire life in virginity. The following quotation from the letter of Pilate to Herod. This supposed letter from Pilate, along with the ascension of Isaiah and the odes of Solomon, are often cited as proofs for Mary's perpetual virginity. But they're not only demonstrable counterfeits, but they're often heretical in their content. The ascension of Isaiah presents Jesus and the Holy Spirit as angels, who are by nature inferior to the Father. It also describes the Holy Spirit as female. After ascending through six levels of heaven, it has Isaiah in the seventh seeing a vision of the birth of Christ. And after two months of days, while Joseph was in his house, and Mary his wife, but both alone, it came to pass that when they were alone, that Mary straightway looked with her eyes and saw a small babe, and she was astonished. And after she had been astonished, her womb was found as formerly before she had conceived. The 19th Ode of Solomon can sound less Gnostic when quoted in part. 
Mary is simply portrayed as delivering without pain. But Orthodox tend to ignore the verses that immediately preceded. The Son is the cup, and he who was milked is the Father, and the Holy Spirit milked him, because his breasts were full, and it was necessary for him that his milk should be sufficiently released, and the Holy Spirit opened his bosom and mingled the milk from the two breasts of the Father and gave the mixture to the world. This is like nothing we find in the scriptures or the early church fathers. Rather than it showing the Proto-Evangelium as reflecting holy tradition, it demonstrates it reflecting a Gnosticism that promoted Mary's ongoing virginity to deny Christ's true humanity. Proponents of Mary's perpetual virginity will sometimes argue they do have more orthodox evidence from before Nicaea. The title Ever Virgin, Hypothenos, was first used by St. Peter of Alexandria in 311. Here's a famous martyr referring to Mary as ever virgin in the year 311. It's not really all that early, but it also has a problem in that it uses a term we don't find elsewhere for over a generation. And the source for the quote is a 10th century manuscript of a 7th century history that gives an excerpt from a supposed 4th century work for which we have no other evidence. You may say, well, how do we see this? Where do we find this in Scripture, Father? Of course, the consciousness of the Church has always borne witness to the supreme holiness of the Mother of God. The consciousness of the Church uh, has hymned this. Some of our earliest hymns to the Mother of God, we, we have third century copies of, of the most ancient, Beneath Thy Compassion, and we have a copy from the third century. That's how long the believers have been hymning uh, the, the, the magnificence of the Mother of God and Her Holiness. This sounds like compelling evidence, until you realize that the papyrus to which he refers has nothing other than the material and penmanship to indicate its date. Trenum is citing the earliest any scholar has speculated for it while ignoring that others, such as Dr. Hans Forster at the University of Vienna, dated as late as the 8th century. Despite all this, Orthodox insist the perpetual virginity of Mary was the universal faith of the early church and never challenged before the late 4th century. There was a Western writer named Helvidius who put forward an opinion opposed to the accepted and received teaching of the church. And his teaching concern the ever virginity of the mother of God, St. Mary. And he concluded this erroneous opinion because of what he read in Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. So Helvidius erroneously stated that after the birth of the Lord, St. Mary then entered into a conjugal life with St. Joseph and had from him other children who are called in the Gospels the brothers and sisters of Christ. But up until that point, the accepted teaching within the church was that St. Mary was a virgin, not only before the birth of the Lord, not only during it, but especially afterwards. And so Helvidius came to this conclusion because he misunderstood and misinterpreted the Greek word eos. And you can, some people pronounce it as hehos, which is translated into English as till, the word till or until. And this word, unlike the English word, does not carry with it any sort of reference to time. It was against Helvidius that the monk Jerome was responding in claiming that all the early church fathers supported Mary's perpetual virginity. As with John of Damascus, few Orthodox actually scrutinize his arguments. Jerome began by calling Helvidius an ignorant boar who has scarce known the first glimmer of learning. Helvidius had pointed out that if Matthew had intended to convey that Joseph never knew Mary as his wife, he could easily have used the language of Judah never again knowing Tamar. Jerome countered that the word translated until didn't mean he eventually did know her. 
He pointed to the example of Jesus saying, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He asked, Will the Lord then after the end of the world has come forsake his disciples? Jerome insisted that if Helvidius' argument was true, Joseph couldn't wait, but must consummate his marriage immediately after Mary gave birth. On your showing, Joseph must at once approach her and be subject to Jeremiah's reproof. They were as mad horses in respect of women. Everyone neg after his neighbor's wife. Otherwise, how can the words stand good? He knew her not till she had brought forth a son. If he waits after the time of another purifying has expired, if his lust must brook another long delay of forty days, the mother must go on purged from her child bed taint, and the wailing infant be attended by the midwives, while the husband clasps his exhausted wife. Therefore, must their married life begin, so that the evangelist may not be convicted of falsehood. It's clear. This isn't what Helvidia said, but merely Jerome trying to make his argument sound ridiculous. Jerome goes on to argue that there being no room in the inn was even further evidence that Joseph couldn't have taken Mary as his wife. Helvidius had appealed to another passage from the Gospel of Matthew. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren James and Joses and Simon and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Jerome said if Joseph wasn't really Jesus' father, these weren't really his brothers. He pointed out that the term brothers can also have a wider meaning, as when Abraham referred to his nephew Lot as his brother, or when Christians call one another brothers. Helvidius had also appealed to Paul referring to the Apostle James as the Lord's brother. Jerome argued that if James, the brother of Jesus, was called an apostle, he could only be referring to James, the son of Alphaeus, since James, the son of Zebedee, had already been martyred. The problem with that is that Barnabas was also called an apostle, even though he was never among the twelve. Jerome also has to argue that Mary's sister was also named Mary, so that James, the son of Mary, could be Jesus' cousin, not brother. Behind all Jerome's mockery and caricatures, his claims boil down to scripture being unclear and church history speaking overwhelmingly against Helvidius. As we've seen, that's not actually the case. In fact, Helvidius pointed to Tertullian and Bishop Victorinus of Patavium as explicitly denying that Mary was a virgin after Jesus' birth. Very little survives from Victorinus. But Helvidius was right that nearly two centuries earlier, Tertullian had been a vocal opponent to the idea that Mary was a perpetual virgin. He strongly affirmed that Jesus was conceived miraculously, but he saw the claim that Jesus had an unnatural birth as Gnostic and denying his true humanity. A natural birth meant Mary had ceased to be a virgin when she delivered him. If as a virgin she conceived, in her childbearing she became a wife. For she became a wife by that same law of the open body, in which it made no difference whether the violence was of the male let in or let out. The same sex performed that unsealing. For all other women, marriage opens it. Consequently, hers was the more truly opened in that it was the more shut. Indeed, she is rather to be called not virgin than virgin, having become a mother by a sort of leap before she was a bride. Tertullian described Mary as one betrothed who would marry after her delivery. He called her Joseph's wife and a model of monogamy, not protectorship by a much older man. He dismissed those who argued Jesus' relationship to his brothers was figurative, but calls them blood relations. In answer to why Jesus would commit his mother to John rather than to them, he pointed to the scripture saying they didn't yet believe on him. Jerome responded, Of Tertullian, I say no more than that he did not belong to the church. Tertullian did become a Montanist, but he was also the man who coined the term Trinity and was called the Master by Cyprian. As with Clement, Origen, and every other early church writer, Orthodox find excuses to arbitrarily pick and choose what's supposed to represent holy tradition. 
Well, we, we allow a heresy in almost every father. Everyone's allowed a little heresy. <laughs> and, and we don't just, we don't pay much attention to it. You know, I'm, I mean, I think of the universalism of St. Saint, of Saint Gregory of Nyssa, for example. We don't, well, you know, he was like that, well, you know. They can't admit that we have Christians reading the scriptures about Mary, just like Protestants, around the year 206. Who do they really have saying otherwise before Nicaea? The Gnostics? Someone pretending to be James, the brother of Jesus? And Clement and Origen, who were basing their opinions on his testimony? Another problem for the Orthodox is that even Jerome contradicts them on what constitutes apostolic tradition. You say that Mary did not continue a virgin. I claim still more that Joseph himself, on account of Mary, was a virgin, so that from a virgin wedlock a virgin son was born. It is no one written that he had another wife, but was the guardian of Mary whom he was supposed to have to wife rather than her husband. The conclusion is that he who was thought worthy to be called father of the Lord remained a virgin. Remember, Eastern Orthodoxy insists that apostolic tradition has Joseph as a widower with grown children. It has always been taught in the early church and believed by all that the brothers of the Lord were the sons of the widower, St. Joseph, from his previous marriage, as is stated in the writings of the early church fathers, St. Epiphanius, the Bishop of Cyprus, St. Cyril, the Pope of Alexandria, and St. Hilary, the Bishop of Poitiers. Orthodox recognize that Rome's claims for Mary have evolved, with her Immaculate Conception becoming official dogma in 1854 and her bodily assumption in 1950. But they tend to ignore how their own claims have evolved. It's assumed Christians have always been praying to her to save them. But the scriptures in the early church fathers actually have very little to say about Mary, beyond that she was a godly virgin who gave birth to Jesus. When Jesus was told his mother and brothers were desiring to speak to him, he asked his disciples, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. In the book of Acts, Mary is only mentioned as one of a group of people being present in the upper room before Pentecost. She may be at the center of Orthodox devotion, but in all the rest of the New Testament, she's only referenced once in passing by the Apostle Paul. There he describes Jesus as made of a woman. Medieval commentators tried to read her into the woman of Revelation 12, but we see none of that in the early church fathers. Irenaeus and Tertullian describe Mary as a new Eve, but little else. Quotes are sometimes given that are supposed to show Mary as the Ark of the Covenant, or prayers being offered for her intercession in the 3rd century. But like Trinum's hymn, they're from sources dated more by wishful thinking than real evidence. Orthodox read what they want from history, even insisting that the reformer John Calvin believed in Mary's perpetual virginity. But for us Orthodox Christians, first of all, it's, we would say for 2,000 years, it's an un, no one doubts this. This is un, no doubt about this, this, do, this doctrine, this dogma, that she was ever virgin. And in the West, I would say the same, actually. And if you look at Luther and Calvin, they both believed it as well. Calvin did reject Helvidius' argument that Mary must have had other sons because Christ's brothers are sometimes mentioned. But just because he didn't believe that one argument was definitive didn't mean he completely disagreed. In commenting on Luke 134, he said, The conjuncture which some have drawn from these words, that she had formed a vow of perpetual virginity, is unfounded and altogether absurd. She would, in that case, have committed treachery by allowing herself to be united to a husband and would have fought contempt on the holy covenant of marriage, which could not have been done without mockery of God. Besides, it is an idle and unfounded supposition that a monastic life existed among the Jews. The real explosion of Marian devotion didn't take place until after the conversion of Constantine and the legalization of Christianity in the 4th century. Writers then began to see her in the Ark of the Covenant, as well as Noah's Ark, she was Moses' burning bush and Jacob's ladder. 
She was the cloud on which Elijah was taken to heaven, and she was the queen of heaven. Eventually, Byzantine coins would show her crowning the emperor, and her icon led armies into battle. To understand how all that transpired, we need to understand the rise of asceticism. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. The second century Gnostic Marcion denounced marriage as an evil and unchaste thing, and the followers of Tatian called the Incritites or self-controlled also rejected it, along with the eating of meat. Irenaeus and Tertullian opposed their unbiblical asceticism, but just as counterfeit scriptures blurred the lines between Gnostic and Orthodox on the subject of Mary, a second century forgery called the Acts of Paul did the same in promoting Gnostic renunciations of food and marriage. The Apostle Paul had warned of forged letters in his own lifetime, but in spite of the book explicitly contradicting his known writings, it found a wide audience. It portrays incidents supposedly left out of the New Testament, such as Paul being thrown to lions in Ephesus, and the strongest lion assuming a posture of prayer and protecting him from the other beast. In recounting his beheading, it says his neck spurted milk instead of blood. In the story of Paul and Thecla, it has him echoing the Gnostics, saying, You have no resurrection, unless you remain in chastity and pollute not the flesh. Thecla is presented as Paul's disciple and a strikingly beautiful woman. She's repeatedly pressed to marry, but refuses to give up her virginity in the hope of obtaining that resurrection. Numerous attempts are made to execute her, and like the Proto-Evangelium, there are miracles on nearly every page. She is delivered from fire, lions, a bear, bulls, and even from man-eating seals. When Paul refuses to baptize her, she jumps in with the seals and baptizes herself. She somehow becomes an apostle and takes up residence in a cave. Other women flock to her to take up the ascetic life. She lives to the age of 90 on nothing but herbs and water. When men seek to rape her to rob her of her miracle-working ability, the mountain opens up and receives her and closes behind her. Despite contradicting the biblical Paul, like the Proto-Evangelium, this is what Eastern Orthodox call holy tradition. St. John Chrysostom says of this wonderful Christian heroine and saint, I seem to see this blessed virgin going to Christ with sacred virginity in one hand and holy martyrdom in the other. The Holy Church glorifies Thecla as the glory of women and guide for the suffering, opening up the way through every torment. From of old, many churches were dedicated to her, one of which was built at Constantinople by the holy equal to the apostles Constantine. The martyr Thecla, a prayerful intercessor for monks and nuns, is also invoked during the tonsure of women into monasticism. Once again, it's not just modern Protestants who say that this is a counterfeit. About the year 200, Tertullian wrote, If the writings which wrongly go under Paul's name claim Thecla's example as a license for women's teaching and baptizing, let them know that, in Asia, the presbyter who composed the writing, after being convicted and confessing that he had done it, was removed from his office. Some will point to Ambrose, Chrysostom, and Augustine, referring to Thecla as if this proves her historicity. But these men were writing three centuries after Paul's death, and mysticism was blurring the lines between fact and fantasy. Their contemporary, the monk Martin of Tours, is described as going days without food or sleep and seeing visions. He said, Agnes, Thecla, and Mary were there with me. Peter also and Paul, the apostles, were frequently seen by him. Moreover, he was in the habit of rebuking the demons by their special names, according as they severally came to him. He found Mercury a cause of special annoyance, while he said that Jupiter was stupid and doltish. Besides Thecla, there are a host of other such orthodox saints whose stories are also demonstrable fictions. 
The feast day for Saints Barlam and Josephat is August 26th for the Greeks and November 19th for the Slavic churches. Their story is historically attributed to John of Damascus and says that the king of India was told by an astrologer that his son Josephat would become a Christian. He tried to prevent this by sheltering him from the world, keeping him in a palace surrounded with pleasures. One day, Josephat went out and saw a leper and a cripple, and then later an old man. After being confronted by disease and death, he met the monk Barlam, who explained that baptism and a life of asceticism were his only hope. If he should fortune to fall into any transgression, there is, it is true, no second regeneration made within us by the Spirit through baptism in the water of the fund and wholly recreating us. That gift is given once for all, but by means of painful repentance, hot tears, toils and sweats, there is a purifying and pardoning of our offenses through the tender mercy of our God. Josephat became a Christian, and soon his father did as well. He gave up being king to become a monk. Josephat eventually gave up the throne as well, and lived out the last of his days as a monk in the desert with Barlam. Their graves were said to have become famous for miracles. Like Thecla, churches were named for these saints, and their story is included in the church's hymns. Relics were brought from India and enshrined in cathedrals. But later contact with India led many to recognize this was simply a reworking of the legend of Buddha. It was a baptizing of pagan asceticism and contradicted all known history. Rome has dropped Thecla, Barlam, and Josephat from its official list of saints. But orthodoxy hasn't. In fact, it calls Thecla equal to the apostles. What we have in her story is the emergence of saints whose lives are less like Elijah and John the Baptist than they are those of the pagan mystics. In India, even today it's considered by many a mark of supreme holiness to never touch someone of the opposite sex and to literally starve yourself to death. This isn't biblical piety, but it was the piety of the Christian monastics. In the 3rd century, like the fictional Thecla, the real-life Anthony rejected marriage, the eating of meat, and even bathing. He took up living amongst the tombs, and about the year 270 retreated into the desert. Christians had earlier fled there trying to escape persecution, but he went to the desert, seeking a life of complete renunciation. The body is purified by much fasting, by many vigils and prayers, and by the service which makes a man to be straightened in body, cutting off from himself all the lusts of the flesh. For the mind purifies it from food, and from drink, and from sleep, and in a word, from all its motions, until through its own purity it frees the body even from the natural emission of seed. Anthony took up residence in an abandoned fort, and would often go days without food or sleep as he eagerly endeavored to make himself fit to appear before God. When Patriarch Kirill says soldiers can wash away their sins through personal sacrifice, he isn't espousing something biblical, but it also isn't something new. During the church's centuries of persecution, the idea became popular that martyrdom provided a second baptism of blood that could wash away the sins the person had committed since their first baptism. Anthony was seeking a different kind of martyrdom. This I testify to you, unless each one of you shall hate all nature of earthly possession, and renounce it and all its works with all his heart, and stretch out the hands of his heart to heaven, to the Father of all, he cannot be saved. If he do what I have said, God will have pity upon him for his labor and grant him that invisible fire which will burn up all impurity from him and our principal spirit will be purified. And then the Holy Spirit will dwell in us and Jesus will abide with us and so we shall be able to worship God as we ought. Anthony was a vocal opponent of the heretic Arius. But his own mystical asceticism is far more like what we see in Gnosticism than what we see in the scriptures. Lack of food and sleep can easily produce hallucinations. But we're told Anthony's constant struggles against demons were a mark of his holiness. He said the devil appeared to him one night in the form of a woman. 
He overcame the temptation and promised his disciples, We shall not retain at all the desire of women or of any other foul pleasure. Anthony described the demons desire to hinder us from entry into the heavens in order that we should not ascend up there from whence they fell. Athanasius tells us the devil was also constantly trying to drive Anthony from the desert with beast, including a man with legs and feet of a donkey. Jerome tells us that at the age of 90, the thought occurred to Anthony that no monk more perfect than himself had settled in the desert. However, in the stillness of the night, it was revealed to him that there was farther in the desert a much better man than he, and that he ought to go and visit him. Along his journey he met a centaur, and then a man with horns and goat's feet. He told Anthony, I am a mortal being, and one of those inhabitants of the desert, whom the Gentiles deluded by various forms of error worship, under the names of fauns, satyrs, and incubi. I am sent to represent my tribe. We pray you in our behalf to entreat the favor of your Lord and ours, who we have learned came once to save the world. Jerome tells doubters a similar creature was captured, its body preserved in salt, and presented to the Emperor Constantine. Anthony eventually met the 113-year-old Paul of Thebes and was overwhelmed with his piety. Paul soon died and two lions came and dug his grave. According to Jerome, no one other than Anthony appears to have met Paul of Thebes, and there's no evidence Jerome ever met Anthony. It's an open question whether Paul of Thebes was any more real than Thecla. But like her, he has been declared a saint by the Orthodox Church. Constantine's conversion brought an end to persecution and a crisis for those who thought only a second baptism of blood could save them. He delayed his baptism to his deathbed. But what were those who had already been baptized to do? The Donatist schism wasn't simply a pursuit of a pure church, but also a political rebellion against Rome that offered the continuing possibility of martyrdom. When not finding it in battle, Augustine tells us some were seeking it by provoking against themselves the swords of men whom they obliged to kill them under fear of instant death. Such sentiments led many to take up monasticism, suffering not at the hands of the state, but at their own. Like the Donatist, they saw Constantine as an antichrist who had seduced the church into peace with a world drenched in all forms of indulgence. He had called the Council of Nicaea, but when Arius had reworded his heresy, Constantine had demanded that he be restored to his office of presbyter. He exiled Athanasius and any others who insisted on the full deity of Christ. It's no surprise that the ascetics opposed him, and it was natural that after his death and the defeat of Arianism, that they would be seen as the champions of truth and models of real holiness. Anthony's biography played an integral role in the conversions of Chrysostom and Augustine. For both, to come to Christ meant they had no choice but to become monks. Chrysostom was described by his disciple as having spent two years without lying down night or day and destroying his health through asceticism. Jerome also imitated Anthony and adopted the maxim that a clean body and clean clothes mean an unclean soul. He described his life in the desert. My skin from long neglect had become black as an Ethiopian's. To eat one's food cooked is looked upon as self-indulgence. Jerome praised the monk Hilarion, who he said lived on fifteen dried figs, or about three hundred calories a day. He praised another unnamed monk, who spent his life in a cistern and kept himself alive on five dried figs, or a mere 100 calories a day. He reminds his readers that with God, all things are possible. Sophronius tells us a story of Mary of Egypt, who lived for years on three loaves of bread. He says the monk Zosimus, like Anthony, was led of the Spirit to find her living in the desert, where she had wandered naked for most of 47 years. She was said to levitate when she prayed, and could walk on water. When she died, just as with Paul of Thebes, a lion came and dug her grave. She was only known to Zosimus, who shared her story with other monks, and after hundreds of years it was passed along to Sophronius. Such stories came to be read in the churches and inspired imitation, but with results that raise as many concerns as the legends. Palladius tells us of Alexandra, who had herself sealed in a tomb, because her beauty had inspired a man to lust. 
She had only a tiny opening for food and water, and remained there for over ten years until she died. Simeon Stylites spent thirty-seven years living on top of a pillar, exposed to the elements. These were supposed to be the new martyrs, taking up their crosses and sacrificing themselves for Christ. When Protestants express skepticism about all this, Orthodox respond that it's because our gospel doesn't really include sanctification. So even though sanctification is formally in the systematic theologies of Protestantism, it is not the emphasis of the Protestant Church, which is why the spiritual disciplines are almost non-existent in the Protestant tradition. It's why they don't have a philokalia. It's why they don't have a tradition of saints like we do. Uh, and sadly, it also means that their expectations for what can be done uh, in the Christian life and for the transformation that can take place in a person's life uh, are low. Mm. And when they read or when they, when they touch an Orthodox saint, when someone would read the life of St. John of San Francisco, who, who lived in our times, or St. Nectarios, these are 20th century saints, they would just be left dumbfounded and either deeply motivated to find out how this could happen or convinced that this was all a fraud. Orthodox accuse Protestants of having a transactional view of the gospel, while theirs is transformational. They quote from Athanasius when he says, Jesus was made man so that we might be made God. They tell us this is theosis, and it's the historic faith of the church. The reality is that Athanasius never used the term, nor did anyone before him. He spoke instead of theopoiesis, and his context was clearly God adopting and sanctifying us, giving us immortality and incorruptibility, all as a means of communion with us. In other words, it was what Protestants would later call deification and union with Christ. Let us then mark that the end of the gospel is to render us eventually conformable to God, and, if we may so speak, to deify us. But the word nature is not here a sense, but quality. There are also at this day fanatics who imagine that we thus pass over into the nature of God, so that he swallows up our nature. But such a delirium as this never entered the minds of the holy apostles. They only intended to say that when divested of all the vices of the flesh, we shall be partakers of divine and blessed immortality and glory, so as to be as it were one with God, as far as our capacities will allow. The Reformers clearly spoke of deification, but they meant something very different from what Eastern Orthodox mean by theosis. To see him face to face is to see him without shame or fear before the dread judgment seat of Christ. That to see him face to face and even and this is the great condescension of God, to see him face to face is actually to see him as an equal. It's, 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 I mean, an unthinkable thought, and yet that's what it is. He has, be, he has condescended to become what we are, that he might raise us up, that he might speak to us. As Jesus says to his, the disciples, I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. This is definitely not what Athanasius taught. In Psalm 82, God mocks human judges for their presumption. He says, Ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men. Athanasius commented, A mutable thing cannot be like God, who is truly unchangeable, any more than what is created can be like its creator. This is why, with regard to us, the holy man said, Who among the gods is like unto thee, Lord, meaning by gods those who, while created, had yet become partakers of the word, as he himself said, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came. But things which partake cannot be identical with or similar to that whereof they partake. Christians are truly adopted as sons of God. We are sanctified and glorified. But the idea that participation in the divine nature means we become equals of God finds no support in Athanasius or the Scriptures. For all the claims theosis represents the ancient faith of the Church, the first use we see of the term was by Gregory Nazianzus in the late 4th century. And just as his use of the word was novel, so was his conception of sanctification. Instead of the focus being on God's descent into manhood, to sanctify and glorify a fallen humanity, he emphasized man's ascetic ascent to God 
in a way that sounds more like Platonic philosophy than the scriptures. Whoever has been permitted to escape by reason and contemplation from matter and this fleshly cloud or veil, whichever it should be called, and to hold communion with God and be associated as far as man's nature can attain, with the purest light, blessed is he, both from his ascent from hence and for his theosis there, which is conferred by true philosophy and by rising superior to the dualism of matter through the unity which is perceived in the Trinity. The issue between Protestants and Orthodox isn't really between a transactional and transformational gospel, but between one that teaches a sanctification rooted in justification and another that uses mystery and exaggerated claims of holiness in order to deny the substitutionary atonement. The movement towards God, which is salvation, is also a movement towards the true self. And this is utterly and completely removed from every possible notion of a juridical relationship. So, the cure suggested by the legal models of atonement simply don't fit the disease. It's not the problem. This whole idea that Christ is a human sacrifice to, to redeem us from God, however you want to phrase it, exactly what it teaches is that Christ died to save us from God. The substitutionary sacrifice is a neo-pagan doctrine worthy of Baal or Molech, but not worthy of the living God. The first thing to understand is that we're not dealing with sin, we're dealing with human suffering. Mm -hmm. And most people fall into sin not because they're intrinsically evil, but because the inner human suffering becomes so strong that it erupts outward in the form of a sin. Mm -hmm. And to understand now, sin isn't just about breaking the law. Sin is about doing something that alienates you again from God. Mm -hmm. It's the alienation that's the problem. The sin is just a symptom, it's just an instrument. But the alienation from God is a problem. Eastern Orthodox point to the Church Fathers' themes of Christ's recapitulation, ransom, and victory, as if these perspectives negate his substitutionary atonement. But over two centuries before anyone used the term theosis, the epistle of Mathetes to Diognetus said, For what else was able to cover our sins except the righteousness of that one? In whom was it possible for us, the lawless and ungodly, to be justified except in the Son of God alone? All the sweet exchange, all the inscrutable work, all the unexpected benefit that the lawlessness of many might be hidden in one righteous man, while the righteousness of one might justify many lawless men. Numerous other examples could be given from Simeon the New Theologian and others, but Orthodox read what they want from history. There's no doubt the Incarnation is essential, but the great emphasis of Scripture is on Christ's crucifixion, death, and resurrection. The theme of a substitutionary atonement runs through all the Bible, beginning in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve were told in the day they ate of the forbidden fruit, they would die. There was death that day, and not just spiritual death, but physical death as well. God stripped them of the fig leaves with which they tried to hide their nakedness and clothed them in the skins of dead animals. There was the death of a substitute. In the very next chapter, Abel's sacrifice of blood is received, but Cain's bloodless sacrifice isn't. His offering of first fruits was acceptable in the tabernacle and temple, but first there had to be atonement for sin. Abraham was called to do what God would ultimately do, offer his son as a sacrifice for sin. The central focus of the tabernacle and temple was the death of a substitute. All through Scripture, we see that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Jesus came to fulfill all the types and shadows, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This atonement is necessary for our sanctification because our alienation from God is far worse than the Orthodox want to admit. As adverse as they may be to the doctrine of original sin, God tells us our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. He describes us as having serpents' hearts and hearts of stone. 
We've committed sins that call down God's just wrath against us. And we're spiritual lepers, unclean, and making all we touch unclean. The good news of the gospel is that Jesus nails our hearts a stone to the cross and gives us new hearts that love him. He takes our sins to the cross, pays their penalty, and gives us his righteousness. He nails our unclean life there and puts his Holy Spirit in us. The Apostle Paul was clear that we are saved by grace through faith. And even that is not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This doesn't negate sanctification, but establishes its basis. He immediately follows up by saying, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Good works are the ones God has commanded, not men presuming to add to his word. Faithfulness may require suffering, but true saints aren't those who make themselves to suffer. They are those who are united with Christ and follow him, whether in persecution or in peace. Good works are the fruit of the Spirit's indwelling, not the prerequisites that the ascetics made them. The biblical gospel is both transactional and transformational, and it's one that leaves no room for boasting other than in Jesus. He is our only righteousness, and He is our sanctification. Orthodox claim the Protestant gospel is contrary to the ecumenical councils. Their problem is that the first six never really address justification. They dealt primarily with the deity and humanity of Christ. What Orthodox really mean is that it's contrary to the Second Council of Nicaea in the 8th century. Even that council didn't directly address justification. But they're right that prayers to divinized images of divinized people don't fit very well with Christ's imputed righteousness. Orthodox assure us that Second Nicaea represents the faith which has been believed everywhere always by all. But remember, it contradicted the Council of Hyaria and was itself contradicted by the later Council of Constantinople. It wasn't only rejected in the East, but also by the Council of Frankfurt in 794 and the Council of Paris in 825. It wasn't really the faith of the Apostles or the Early Fathers, so much as it was that of the ascetics and two widowed empresses. Both have been declared saints and models of theosis. We're supposed to ignore that Irene, who calls Second Nicaea, later became sole ruler of the empire by having her son's eyes gouged out and throwing him into prison to die of his wounds. We're supposed to ignore that Theodora, the empress who later established the triumph of orthodoxy, was overthrown when accused by her brother of plotting the same for her son. Some accused Theodora's brother of lying, but the 11th century historian John Skylitzes reports that she had a similar plan for the deposed patriarch of Constantinople when he was accused of desecrating an icon. When the devout and sovereign lady heard of this, burning with godly zeal, she ordered his eyes to be put out. This did not happen, because certain kindly disposed persons interceded for him, but she dispatched some guards to punish him with two hundred lashes. The Bible condemns both the icon and the punishment, but asceticism subordinates the Bible to mystical experience and justifies both. For much of church history, such a standard has allowed religious ascetics and political tyrants to make common cause. Those who sought to imitate the persecuted have themselves repeatedly used the power of the state to persecute those who reject their asceticism. The ascetics had seen themselves as part of the remnant church during the ascendancy of Arianism. But with its defeat, they became very much part of the establishment. The Trinitarian Theodosius became emperor in the year 379. He soon exiled the Arian Patriarch of Constantinople and appointed Gregory Nazianzus to replace him. It was as Pope Damas's secretary that Gregory's disciple Jerome had responded to Helvidius in the year 383. This is the same Damasus who ignored the election of Ursinus as pope and had himself elected by a rival group. He then hired a gang to go to the Basilica of Liberius and murder 137 of his opponents. 
and he persuaded the emperor to exile his rival. Despite this, Jerome praised Damasus and called Rome the house where alone the paschal lamb can be rightly eaten. For all their newfound power, the ascetics weren't without opposition. In the year 384, Jerome had a disciple named Blazilla, a senator's daughter, and a 20-year-old widow. He rejoiced that she lamented the loss of her virginity more than the death of her husband. She tried to imitate the monks about which he wrote, and within four months of becoming his disciple, she starved herself to death. Like Alexandra and Simeon Stylites, Boisilla would eventually be venerated as a saint, but the initial public reaction was outrage against the ascetics. With the death of Damasus shortly afterwards, Jerome was forced to leave Rome for Bethlehem. It was there nine years later he would receive a letter informing him that the monk Jovinian had repudiated asceticism and published two books against it. Even though Jerome was writing three and a half centuries after Jesus' crucifixion, he's been declared a saint, so his response to Jovinian is assumed by Orthodox to represent the historic and apostolic faith. But the reality is that Jovinian was ultimately silenced through the emperor, having him and his followers flogged, and exiled under threat of death. In him we see that Protestantism isn't the historic novelty Orthodox try to claim, but part of a long-running battle for the biblical faith. Jovinian's books were burned, but it's clear that he saw the ascetics as repeating the errors of the Pharisees, adding man-made traditions to the Bible, seeking merit with God, and obsessing over rituals. Jerome describes him as saying that in Christ, Virgins, wives, and widows all possess the same spiritual state, that there is no difference between abstinence from food and its reception with thanksgiving, and that they who with full assurance of faith have been born again in baptism cannot be overthrown by the devil. For Jerome, this was ridiculous. Clearly, virgins were more loved by Jesus because they were more worthy of that love. Therefore Christ loves virgins more than others because they willingly give what was not commanded them. And it indicates greater grace to offer what you are not bound to give than to render what is exacted of you. Jovinian pointed out that the whole of Scripture was against such a view. The one thing that had not been good before sin entered the world was for man to be alone. God ordained marriage and declared it very good. The saints of the Old Testament had nearly all been married and in spite of ascetic objections that that was before the Incarnation, nothing in the New Testament indicated a radical change. The ascetics claimed Joshua as a type of Christ was a virgin, but they were arguing from the silence of Scripture, not its explicit teaching. Marriage was celebrated throughout the Bible, especially in the Song of Solomon, which Jovinian refused to dismiss as mere allegory. Jesus had blessed marriage by his presence at the wedding at Cana, and the Apostle Paul used it as a picture of Christ's relationship to his church. Paul had said, let every man have his own wife. Jerome responded, He would have never added, let each man have his own wife, unless he had previously used the words, but because of fornications. Do away with fornication, and he will not say, let each man have his own wife. Jerome tried to differentiate himself from the Gnostics, saying we do not follow the views of Marcion and Manichaeus and disparage marriage, nor deceive by the air of Tatian, the leader of the Incritites, do we think all intercourse impure. In spite of such qualifications, he made clear that no serious Christian could ever entertain the idea of marriage. If we are to pray always, it follows that we must never be in the bondage of wedlock, for as often as I render my wife her due, I cannot pray. Marriage replenishes the earth, virginity fills paradise. The truth is that, in view of the purity of the body of Christ, all sexual intercourse is unclean. The defilement of marriage is not washed away by the blood of martyrdom. Jovinian had pointed out that Peter and other apostles were married, but Jerome insisted it was oral tradition that once they were received into the apostolate, they forsook the offices of marriage. The apostle Paul had been clear that singleness can allow someone to focus more on the things of God 
But what he offered is a practical suggestion. Jerome understood as setting forth the way to establish merit with God. The Apostle Paul had said, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Jerome ignored that Paul was correcting an assertion made by the Corinthians. If it is good not to touch a woman, it is bad to touch one, for there is no opposite to goodness but badness. Not only do we see Jerome twisting Paul's words, but it's important to recognize that the great defender of Mary's perpetual virginity, like the Gnostics, thought that marriage was inherently bad. Not only were its pleasures to be rejected, but so were the pleasures of food. Jerome called Jovinian a pig and pointed to the fasting God commanded on the Day of Atonement as evidence that fasting was a long-standing tradition among God's people. But it was only on that one day each year that God commanded all Israel to fast. A special fast might be called for national repentance, and there were individual fasts during times of mourning and intense prayer. But food was seen as a blessing from God that was to be enjoyed with thanksgiving. Jesus fasted for forty days before being tempted by the devil, but he was later challenged by the disciples of John why they and the Pharisees fasted often, and his disciples didn't fast at all. The Jews even called him a glutton and a drunk. Not only do we not see weekly fasts prescribed in Scripture, but the one time Jesus mentions them was as a mark of hypocrisy. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Please note that the Pharisee thanked God for making him a righteous man. But his focus was on how he was cooperating with God's grace and proving his worthiness. The publican understood his only hope was in the mercy of God. It's important to understand that the very name Pharisee means set apart or holy. Many thought them to be the true saints of Israel because they were so much more rigorous in their asceticism than the ordinary people. In spite of all this, Jesus denounced them as hypocrites. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. The Pharisees added to the scriptures all kinds of oral traditions about Sabbath observance and fasting. Both were biblical principles. But rather than their exaggeration being even more holy, Jesus condemned them. Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. The Pharisees' apparent renunciation of the world was in fact a fraud, a fraud for themselves and for others. Their great show of religion was meant to hide their rebellion against God. Jesus said, Unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. This righteousness wasn't found through greater rigorism, but through faith in the Lord Jesus. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. 
Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. The Apostle Paul called on Christians to present their bodies a living sacrifice to God. He fasted and disciplined his body. He even placed himself for a time under a Nazarite vow, abstaining from wine and the cutting of his hair. But he also warned that rigorous asceticism wasn't the way to holiness. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using, after the commandments and doctrines of men. For the ascetics, saints were those who had not merely been baptized, but worked their way to holiness. Jerome has Jesus say, I might tell you, he says, that I go to prepare a place for you, if there were not many mansions in my father's house. That is to say, if each individual did not prepare for himself a mansion through his own works, rather than receive it through the bounty of God. The preparation is therefore not mine, but yours. This view is supported by the fact that it profited Judas nothing to have a place prepared, since he lost it by his own fault. Jovinian agreed with Jerome that there was more to being a saint than simply being baptized. But rather than someone's works being the missing element, it was baptism with the Holy Spirit. Jerome reports him as saying, If any are tempted, it only shows that they were baptized with water, not with the Spirit, as we read was the case with Simon Magus. Jerome mocks the idea that Christians aren't tempted. But remember, he earlier used the language not of temptation, but of being overthrown of the devil. Just as he had done with Helvidius, he seems to be misrepresenting Jovinian. Simon Magus was baptized, but he wasn't simply tempted. He made shipwreck of the faith. What we really seem to have Jovinian saying is what the Reformed would argue over a thousand years later. The Spirit isn't bound to regenerate everyone on whom the Church applies water, but those who are truly regenerate won't be overthrown. When Jesus told the Pharisee Nicodemus that he must be born again, Jerome believed he was pointing to the sacrament of baptism. Jovinian is saying that like circumcision, the physical act was a pointer to the spiritual reality that can function independently of the sign. Israel was called to receive not just circumcision of the flesh, but of the heart, something only God could do. Likewise, the church is called to receive not just an outpouring of water, but of the Spirit. Once again, something only God can do. For the ascetics, we make ourselves fit for the reception of the Spirit. For Jovinian, it's the coming of the Spirit that makes us fit. Without Him we're dead, but by Him we have faith and repentance and are united with Christ. For Jovinian, a new birth by the Spirit led to a focus on Christ. For the ascetics, a new birth in water baptism led them to focus on Mary. Gnostics had insisted on her ongoing virginity to deny Christ's true humanity. But the monks insisted on it to claim her as a fellow ascetic and sinless role model. The Proto-Evangelium's account of Mary living alone for years in the Holy of Holies became the model for a life of solitary contemplation, and countless monks and nuns had themselves walled into their cells as they sought to find a similar perfection. Jovinian's rejection of Mary's perpetual virginity was seen by the ascetics as an attack on the Mother of God and their whole conception of holiness. Pope Sericius and Bishop Ambrose called synods to declare his teachings heresy. But those teachings were popular, and Jovinian had the support of many bishops. When even Jerome's mockery wasn't enough to turn the tide of popular opinion, Sericius persuaded the emperor Honorius 
to have Jovinian and his followers flogged and exiled. It's noteworthy that a theology that promotes a spiritual hierarchy in the church was enforced by an emperor committed to a similar hierarchy in the state. Constantine made Christianity legal for the first time. Theodosius made it the only legal religion. And Honorius made asceticism its only legal expression. In spite of this, resistance to asceticism never really went away. A few years after Jovinian's exile, Vigilantius, a disciple of Jerome, also renounced asceticism. He said it led to superstition supplanting the Word of God and the saints supplanting Christ. He also rejected prayers for the dead. Jerome, who was supposed to represent ascetic holiness, called him a monster and a demoniac. He said, the wretch's tongue should be cut out. Helvidius, Jovinian, Vigilantius, and others called the church of the 4th century back to the biblical gospel of Christ crucified. But with the emperor and his army behind them, the ascetics not only defined orthodoxy, but they wrote the official histories. Jesus had said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. With the conversion of Constantine, that distinction was largely lost. Caesar was claimed to be the viceroy of God. He called ecumenical councils, and could depose bishops at will. Constantinople became not just the seat of government, but the center of the church. Long after Constantine's death, Arianism was finally defeated. But to justify the union of church and state, the ascetics set about rehabilitating his memory. Constantine was declared not only a saint, but like Thecla, equal to the apostles. His support for Arianism and persecution of Athanasius were largely forgotten, and his vision of a cross was supposed to be evidence of his spiritual standing. The version of the story he first recounted to Lactantius wasn't of a daylight vision seen by his whole army but of a nighttime dream, a dream not of a cross, but of a Cairo symbol. Like so many such stories, it changed over time. But because Orthodox embraced the later version and insist their church is infallible, we're to believe Eusebius corrected Lactantius. We're also to believe that a generation later, Eusebius would be corrected by the historian Socrates Scholasticus. Eusebius had told of Constantine's mother Helena, discovering the Holy Sepulchre. But even though he personally knew her, he apparently neglected to mention that in that sepulchre, she found the true cross of Christ, its signboard, the crosses of the two thieves, and even the nails. Though this version was written long after her death and the death of Constantine, orthodoxy assures us it's the authoritative one. Mary has also been reinvented over the years. Theodore the Studite portrayed her as interceding with a Jesus who was unwilling to save. After going back and forth, Mary says, O Lord, deliver thy servant who draws nigh to thee from punishment. I implore thee, remember not his transgressions, for though he sinned, O Savior, he didst turn to me for refuge, and I entreatest thee. Through me receive this man, for thou dost fulfill the petitions of all. Jesus responds, O mother, he is not worthy to take refuge in thy mercy, for no man didst provoke my wrath as much as he. Yet by thy precious prayers I will not punish him on the day of judgment should he bring me fruits of repentance. The Proto-Evangelium and writings of Pseudo-Dionysius eventually became the basis of Gregory Palamas' hesychastic theology. Instead of the simple godly virgin of Scripture, he would describe her. She alone forms the boundary between created and uncreated nature, and no one can come to God except through her and the mediator born of her, and none of God's gifts can be bestowed on angels or men except through her. As in this case with lamps on earth constructed of glass or some other transparent material, it is impossible to look at the light or enjoy its rays except through the lamp 
so it is beyond the reach of all to look upwards to God or be helped by Him to make progress in any direction except through the ever-Virgin, this God-bearing lamp, who is truly radiant with divine brightness. Orthodox tell us praying to Mary is like asking our friends to pray for us. But Mary became not only more gracious than Jesus and the only hope of sinners, but also the Queen of Heaven and patron saint of the empire. Martyrdom was once again available, no longer just in asceticism, but now in dying for her kingdom. When her armies began to be overrun by Muslims, even the emperors began to reconsider the claims of the ascetics. The triumph of orthodoxy managed to silence the iconoclast, but the empire did eventually fall. Constantinople has been reduced to 4,000 orthodox in a sea of Muslims and is now called Istanbul. The Hagia Sophia is a mosque. Contrary to the claims of the Orthodox, other attempts have been made to bring the Church back to the Scriptures, most notably by Patriarch Cyril Ocaras in the 17th century. But even his history has been rewritten. After being anathematized as a Protestant by those who personally knew him, a later council denied he had ever been anything other than Orthodox. The man who called himself a Calvinist Patriarch has even been declared a saint. Orthodox now venerate the icon of the man who denounced icons. The Orthodox continue to rewrite history to suit themselves. We see this especially on the subject of the aerial toll houses. Around the year 956, Gregory, a disciple of Basil the Younger, had a vision. The soul of Theodora recounted to him that as she was taken by the angels, demons opposed her. She was taken to twenty toll houses, where each of her sins was revisited by the demons. They kept pointing to my sins, but the holy angels sought out my good deeds. And indeed, with God's help, they found all that, by God's grace, I ever did of good. The angels gathered together everything that was good, all those instances when I gave alms to the needy, or fed the hungry, or gave the thirsty to drink, or clothed the naked, or brought into my house and rested there the homeless, or served the servants of God, or visited the sick, and comforted them, or those who were imprisoned. And also when I went with diligence to God's house and prayed with all my heart and shed tears, or when I attentively listened to what was read and sung in church, or brought to church incense and candles, or filled with oil the church lamps before the icons, or kissed the icons with awe and reverence, or when I fasted and abstained on Wednesdays, Fridays, or during other fasts, or when I prostrated myself before God and spent nights awake in prayer, or when I sighed to God and wept for my sins, or confessed my sins before my spiritual father with great regret for what I had done, and then tried with all my strength to balance my sins with good deeds, or when I did anything good to my neighbors, when I bore no anger to my enemies, bore no grudges and meekly endured hurts and reproaches, did good in return for evil, humbled myself, felt sorry for those who suffered and commiserated with those to whom anything bad happened, comforted those who were weeping and rendered them assistance, supported any good beginning and tried to turn people away from what was bad, or myself turned my eyes away from vanity and kept my tongue from oaths, lies, or bearing false witness, or speaking without need. And all my other good deeds, even the least important ones, did the holy angels gather and make ready to put on the scale in order to balance my evil deeds. In spite of all her righteousnesses, it was the prayers of the dead St. Basil the Younger that secured her deliverance. Many Orthodox recognize Gregory's vision of saints being handed over to demons for judgment sounds more like paganism than anything we see in the Bible. And Theodore's defense sounds a lot like the prayer of the Pharisee. It not only brings up the unpleasant history of patriarchal indulgences, but it also flies in the face of those trying to promote universalism. 
despite support from St. John of San Francisco, Father Sarah from Rose, and a host of others. Some try to say the toll houses aren't really orthodox. But I want to go on to talking about the toll house theory. Now this, actually, some traditionalist orthodox teachers put forward this teaching, which I and others don't believe is orthodox. Number one, there is no biblical evidence for toll houses. There's none. I mean, there, there, you cannot bring forth one clear passage of scripture that defends this theory. It is based on the vision of a monk around the year 1000, okay? This monk is not even recognized as a saint by the church. Just this monk who he said he had a vision of another saint and she revealed this grand design of the toll houses to him and now we're supposed to take his word for it. Okay, there is also this treatise supposedly by St. Cyril of Alexandria who was a great teacher and bishop in the, uh, the 4th and 5th centuries. And there's this, this uh, text by him that supposedly teaches us about the toll houses. Well, I mean, scholars have very clearly shown that it's a forgery. I mean, the language, the terminology, the style does not fit Cyril. And in fact, the teaching in this document contradicts teaching in various authenticated writings of St. Cyril. So it's not by St. Cyril. David Bentley Hart attributes support for the toll houses to what he calls fundamentalist, doctrinaire, and yet deeply uneducated primitivism promoted principally by former evangelicals. Yet Patriarch Kirill insists they have been believed everywhere always by all. And similar teachings can be found in St. Anthony and St. Athanasius. When mysticism trumps scripture, and there's no relevant ecumenical council, who really gets to define orthodoxy? When you open our Pedalion, when you open our book of sacred canons that govern the church, you find first the 85 canons of the Holy Apostles. And there, in Canon 69, you see a marvelous canon that says this, if any priest or bishop uh, fails to fast during Great Lent, or on Wednesdays and Fridays, let him be deposed. And if any layman fail to fast in Great Lent, or on Wednesdays and Fridays, let him be excommunicated. To have 85 canons directly from the apostles would be impressive. The problem is, second century church seemed unaware of them. Christians not only couldn't agree on the day on which Easter should be celebrated, but they disagreed on the nature of the fast. The controversy is not only about the day, but also about the actual character of the fast. For some think that they ought to fast one day, others two, others even more. Some count their day as 40 hours day and night. The 40 hours corresponded to the time between Jesus' death and resurrection. But by the late 4th century, some were fasting for as long as 40 days. When Rufinus later mistranslated Irenaeus' hours as days, it led many to believe that Lent went back to the apostles. But Irenaeus actually said, Such variation of observance did not begin in our own time, but much earlier, in the days of our predecessors, who, it would appear, disregarding strictness, maintained a practice which is simple and yet allows for personal preference. Protestants readily accept Irenaeus' position that the fast was a matter of personal preference. Orthodox accuse us of selectively reading the Fathers, but like the Proto-Evangelium and the Acts of Paul and Thecla, the apostolic canons were condemned by Pope Galatius in the 5th century as a counterfeit. Orthodox can point to the 7th century Council of Truo that says otherwise, but then other evidence can be presented against that. The Orthodox will appeal to the Didache, or the teaching of the Twelve Apostles to support weekly fast, but there's no evidence it's any more apostolic than the apostolic canons.
and they gloss over how they reject its prescriptions for the Eucharist. Rather than trying to judge between contradictory traditions, we have the testimony of God in the Bible. Just as there was no Old Testament prescription for the weekly fast of the Pharisees, there's no New Testament prescription for the weekly fast of the Orthodox or a fast at Easter. Fasting is part of the Christian life, but when and how are matters of individual conscience. By excommunicating people for rejecting their counterfeit canons, the Orthodox Church is presuming to speak for God, but they tell us the alternative is chaos. You begin to ask, where did we come up with 20,000 different denominations? And you realize it's because of the fact that everybody in, in, saw themselves as the one that would privately interpret the scriptures. You have over 30,000 Protestant denominations registered with the U.S. government, each affirming that their particular expression of Christianity is the biblical one and being in conflict. Today, uh, Protestant books chronicle 40,000 denominations. The current count is actually just under 45,000. But what they don't tell you is that 584 of them are Orthodox. These statistics come from the Center for the Study of Global Christianity. The numbers are so high because they separately count every country in which a denomination functions, along with all the different organizations represented by it. The Roman Catholic Church is counted 370 times because not only is its Latin rite in nearly every country, but there are numerous other rites as well. The list also includes thousands upon thousands of Restorationist churches. As much as Orthodox try to identify them as Protestant, they make no pretense to holding to the Bible as their sole infallible authority. Rather like the Orthodox, they add things. Instead of the Proto-Evangelium, the Mormons who are counted 173 times add the Book of Mormon. Rather than demonstrating the insufficiency of the Bible, these statistics actually show man's hostility to it. They add to the scriptures in order to ignore the things they don't like. For those who actually hold to Sola Scriptura, the real question becomes whether we only reject traditions that contradict the Bible or also the ones without clear positive warrant. The resulting differences can be significant, but they're often less striking than the divisions in Orthodoxy. In March of 2023, Patriarch Bartholomew of Constantinople accused Patriarch Kirill of promoting pseudo-religion and theologically legitimizing criminal behavior. With the end of the Soviet Union and the bankruptcy of the communist ideology, pseudo-religion emerged. The church and the state leadership in Russia cooperated in the crime of aggression and share the responsibility for the resulting crimes, like the shocking abduction of Ukrainian children. Similarly, our interreligious dialogue has to focus not only on ways to resist, to, to resist to and neutralize the capacity of the leadership of the Moscow Patriarchate to undermine unity and to theologically legitimize criminal behavior. Orthodox insist the church is one, but most major American cities have numerous men claiming to be its Orthodox bishop. There are 14 Chalcedonian and six non-Chalcedonian churches, one Assyrian church along with old believers, old calendarists, and numerous other such groups. If you want to celebrate homosexuality, there's an Orthodox bishop for you. If you want to pretend Orthodoxy is the great bastion against sexual immorality, there's another bishop for you. If you want to believe everyone goes to heaven, or if you want to believe most of the world is going to hell, there's a bishop for you. Moscow can be the third Rome, or largely irrelevant. Orthodoxy is whatever you want it to be, so long as you don't deny the Trinity, and so long as you don't reject icons. And blaspheme the holy icons which the holy church receiveth in remembrance of the works of God and of his saints to inspire at the beholders with piety and to incite them to imitate their examples 
and to those who say that they are idols. Some Orthodox claim they know where the church is, but they don't know where it isn't. That sounds charitable, but it clearly flies in the face of the anathemas of the 1672 Synod of Jerusalem. It made very clear the church is not to be found with the Protestants. We may have Irenaeus, Tertullian, and on points like the Old Testament canon, we have even Jerome on our side. But Orthodoxy insists it alone represents the faith of the Apostles. We may have the Council of Hyeria and numerous others on our side, but they believe they have something that trumps them all. I know a man, Father Dwayne Peterson, who walked inside a church and was converted just through seeing the altar and the icons because he said, it, it was, I felt as though I stepped into the book of Revelation. Well, there's a list of books you can read, but again, nothing will substitute for coming and being there, smelling the wax and the incense, hearing the chants, watching the people all around you prostrate themselves, especially during, um, during the first week of Lent. Just as Orthodox try to portray Mormons as Protestants, many try to portray Protestant worship as a pastor in skinny jeans giving a TED Talk backed with a praise band. The reality is that many so-called Protestants are actually imitating the Orthodox, ignoring the scriptures, and making the same direct appeal to emotions, just in a more modern way. Orthodox worship may have a much older pedigree, but it's no more apostolic. Both forms downplay our sinfulness and assume that whatever makes us feel right must be pleasing to God. Both subordinate the scriptures to their experience, rather than the other way around. Before it became subservient to the state, the church didn't have icons, incense, and a rebuilt holy of holies. What it did have was the word of God. That word was read and preached. The psalms were sung, and prayers offered that were modeled after those in the scriptures. The word was also made visible in baptism and the Lord's Supper. Such word-centered worship doesn't elicit the same raw emotional response as orthodoxy, but it's not supposed to. The confidence of the Reformed is that God's Spirit speaks by and with His Word and reveals Christ to His people in a far more glorious way than all the smells and bells of Eastern Orthodoxy or all the repetitive choruses of Pentecostals. Like the early church, the Reformed model for worship isn't the temple but the synagogue. The Epistle to the Hebrews made clear that in spite of appearances, the persecuted church had better than anything Judaism could offer. The elaborate worship of the temple was anticipatory of Christ's coming. But now that he has come, we have a better temple in him, one not made with hands, and a better priest who has made a better, once for all, sacrifice for sins. Eastern Orthodoxy largely ignores that and tries to recreate a temple made with hands. It's turned its presbyters into priests and recreates a holy of holies where only some may enter. God rent the veil of the old temple, and he tells us all God's people are now priests, and he bids us to enter boldly the spiritual reality of which the old holy of holies was only a shadow, and the orthodox one is but a pitiful counterfeit. Orthodox sneer at all this. He sent forth the Holy Spirit as a gift to communicate his life, because that's why he came. He didn't come to give us a book. He came to give us a life. The life orthodoxy offers you is a Jesus who is less gracious than Mary and a Jesus whose atonement is insufficient to cleanse you of your sins. It offers you traditions that not only contradict the Bible, but one another. It offers you saints who never existed and others whose lives have been repeatedly modified to fit an evolving narrative. In the place of God's Spirit speaking by and with His Word, 
It offers you some badly painted pieces of wood, incense, and candles. Contrary to those who want to tell us life matters more than truth, we point them to Jesus, both in terms of his view of the scriptures and in him saying that he is the way, the truth, and the life. You can't have one without the other, because they're all to be found in him. We don't believe that and Constantine are equals to the apostles, nor the Second Council of Nicaea. Jesus gave the real apostles the keys of the kingdom, and they define real orthodoxy. Our plea is to stop kissing the Gospels. Instead, open them and read them for what they really say, rather than what others tell you they say. They may not offer immediate mystical ecstasy, but they present a Jesus and a gospel far, far more glorious than anything Eastern Orthodoxy can ever offer. This is the real faith of the apostles. This is the faith of the early church. This is the faith of the truly Orthodox. Thank mm-hmm. you.